Well, good morning. So last night, I tried to uh, convince you of three things. That humans have a common nature. That, whoa, and then the lights go out. I wonder what, if I keep talking what will happen here. Okay. okay, so first, that humans have a common nature. Second, that uh, this nature helps explain the kinds of things that humans easily learn and thus what things are likely to become widespread to the point that we recognize them as cultural. And that includes these ideas, beliefs, practices, identifications, attitudes that we call religious. And then from that kind of perspective, it looks like there's something very natural about religion, if you will. It looks like that part of human nature, for instance, is that we very easily see design and purpose in the natural world. We seem to be predisposed to that. We very easily make sense of things in the world in terms of minded, intentional beings like other humans, but also sometimes uh, beings that don't, don't seem to have bodies or at least are invisible and may account for this perceived design and order in the natural world. That is one of the, the big theses of this area called cognitive science of religion, and it's called the naturalness thesis. When it's applied to kids, then it's called, I've called it the born believers thesis. Um, that's where we went. And what you saw there then was um, I tried to give you a taste for a particular area of the scientific study of religion and what it means to then create these kinds of scientific explanations of religion. So then my question for the second session here is, do these kinds of explanations of religion explain it away? Um, and you see that I've put the it in scare quotes. Of course, the it is referencing religion. I could have put religion in scare quotes as well, because that's going to be one of my takeaway points here as well, that maybe there isn't an it to explain, let alone explain away. What? Really? That doesn't sound right. Good. I'm glad I have your attention. All right. So another way of looking at the problem is to reference uh, Harry Potter. Why not? Uh, this quote is coming from uh, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. Have you read the book? They're good books. Come on. They're great books. The movies, eh, the books are great. Uh, I like the earlier movies better, but that's, you know, it's Chris Columbus directing better than, anyway. Um, so uh, since most of you read it, I'm not worried about spoiling it. This quote comes from uh, right at the end of a conversation that Harry has been having with Professor Dumbledore. And the spoiler here is that they're both dead, okay? They're in some place that's described as like King's Cross Station, but clean. So we know it's not in this world. If you've ever been to King's Cross Station in London, you know what I'm talking about. All right, so uh, Dumbledore and Harry have been having this conversation, and at the end of it, Harry says, tell me one last thing, said Harry, is this real or has this all been happening in my head? Right, so what's Harry getting at? There seems to be this dichotomy between what's real and what's happening in your head. And that's the worry in this space that a lot of people who hear the kind of lecture you heard last night, they end up asking me as, well, you're, you're developing a cognitive explanation of religious thought and practice. That is an explanation that's all about what's in people's heads. Does that mean that's the end of it? That the religious beliefs, experiences that people have are just in their heads. So that's what I want to take up today. And I'll ruin it right off the bat, uh, at least in a certain respect. Uh, do I want to go there? No, OK, I'm going to hide that for just a second. Uh, just as a way of, uh, I'm going to take off my glasses here, because I'm getting side glare. And I don't really need the glasses to see you. So. Um, First, I want to make a distinction between causes and reasons. Okay, we often, in normal, ordinary human language, uh, in English especially, we just use this. 
why is, you know, hey, why do you believe that? And we might give a reason or we might give a cause. And we don't carefully distinguish between the two, but I think there is an important distinction. What I mean by reasons is the logical connections that ground my beliefs. Sometimes it's called, you know, the, uh, the ground consequence type of reasons. Um, but reasons need not be the causes of beliefs. And by causes here, I mean the mechanisms, whether they're social or psychological or neuroscience, neurophysiological, or whatever they are, okay? Um, I might believe that, uh, uh, for instance, suppose that Bob, my friend Bob, has a cat named Buttercup, and I believe that Buttercup has fur. Well, what are my reasons for, for believing that Buttercup has fur? Well, all cats have fur, Buttercup is a cat, Ergo, buttercup has fur. I've reasoned. I can spell out those reasons for believing that buttercup has fur. Those reasons, then, are logical connections. That was just a, a syllogism. But it need not be the case, even though I can give you reasons why I believe buttercup has fur, um, that those reasons need not be the causes of the belief. In fact, probably aren't. I could believe it has fur, buttercup has fur, because I have this concept of cat that I carry around in my head that includes fur. Bob told me he has a cat, and I simply applied the concept to the cat. I didn't reason my way to it, I assumed it because of something causally going on in my head. Okay, buttercup is an ordinary cat, I'm going to assume it has fur. Notice, yes, I know there are hairless cats. Somebody's already thinking that. Not all cats have fur. And that's the point, too, is you may have perfectly good reasons that actually lead you to a false conclusion. And you may have perfectly good causes that lead you to a false conclusion as well. As far as I can tell, reasons and causes don't have a, a simple, uh, predictable relationship with truth or not. So just having reasons for a particular belief doesn't mean you're on necessarily on better ground in terms of whether or not the belief is true or false. Okay? Uh, likewise, you could generate lots of reasons for your belief that maybe your spouse or your mother or that your children love you. Right? Like if you think about somebody um, that you, know, you think loves you, what are your reasons for thinking they love you? Well, you can probably think about those right now and come up with a few. You might be able to provide evidence for yourself. Oh, well, they did this kind of thing, they said that kind of thing, and so forth. But the causes, the causes, not the reasons, the causes for you to have that belief that they love you may have nothing to do or little to do with those reasons. It could be that the primary causes uh, maybe have more to do with the release of oxytocin in your brain when you've interacted with such a person, okay? And that gave you that warm, fuzzy feeling that now you're labeling as love. Note, I'm, again, I'm not saying that's not true. So don't go and divorce your spouse now. Uh, you don't love me. You're just oxytocin. I mean, it's not, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just trying to make the distinction between causes and reasons here. Okay? So if we're going to talk about or ask the question, do scientific explanations explain away religious beliefs? I think then we need to understand what are the conditions in which that could happen. So the question is, when can causes disrupt reasons? Okay? Sciences are about causes, not about reasons. So when do causes provide reasons to doubt beliefs? A scientific theory can explain away when it challenges the reasons for beliefs. But simply having causes is not enough. As William James, who is often called the father of American psychology, um, pointed out uh, over 100 years ago. So this is from a lecture he gave at Yale University. And here he was talking about the biological, or what he was calling organic in the language of the time, explanations of religious experiences. He just simply observes, there's not a single one of our states of mind, high or low, healthy or morbid, that has not some organic process as its condition. 
He means cause there. Scientific theories are organically conditioned just as much as religious emotions are. And if we only knew the facts intimately enough, we should doubtlessly, doubtless see the liver determining the dicta of the sturdy atheist as decisively as it does those of the Methodist under conviction anxious about his soul. Uh, James is being a little funny there, but what he, the point he's making, because he doesn't really believe the liver is involved, but he's, he's sort of using some. He's being funny and, and pointing out that, look, if you think that because there is a biological cause for a religious experience, that, aha, that religious experience isn't real or valid or, you know, good in some way, well, there's a biological cause for any belief you have, any experience you have, including the experience of having a scientific explanation for that religious experience. You follow that? So if just having a biological, in this case, or you might say a neurophysiological or a psychological cause for a particular belief somehow does away with the, the validity of that belief, well then, so is that belief done away with. It saws off the branch you're standing on. Okay, so just having an explanation is insufficient. But that doesn't mean that some explanations aren't a little more interesting philosophically, and that's where we're going to go. But before I do that, you know, uh, I should remind you of uh, what, what are the kinds of explanations on offer. Again, to kind of ruin my story here, because I like to do that up front, <laughs> is, you know, I didn't need to go to William James for this point. I could have stayed with J.K. Rawlings because uh, here was the line again. Harry's asking, tell me one last thing. I said, Harry, is this, in my, is this real or has it been happening inside my head? And uh, Dumbledore wisely responds, well, of course it's happening inside your head, Harry, but why on earth should that mean it's not real? Which is a better way to make the point than William James, so maybe I should have stuck with Harry Potter. But what are these... Um, what are some analogous cases to try to drive this home? What are some analogous cases? I've already sort of referenced one, um, and that's this one. Evolutionary psychologists can give you probably a pretty good reason why causes you think your mother loves you. But that doesn't mean she doesn't, I don't think. Um, and that you shouldn't believe that your mother loves you. you and that you don't have good reasons. That's quite beside the point. Or another example, evolutionary psychologists and maybe even neuroscientists at a certain point could tell us why we think it's horrible to drown orphans. I'm assuming we think that's a horrible thing. Um, maybe I shouldn't take it first granted, but I will. Um, does that mean we shouldn't think that it's horrible to drown orphans? I don't think so. OK, well, what are the kinds of explanations of religion on offer? Um, one, I'm going to give you basically three big categories, adaptationist explanations, byproduct explanations, and exaptationist explanations. And these are not mutually exclusive. Okay, so let's start with adaptationist explanations. This is using adaptation here. This is jargon from evolutionary theory. And what we mean here is uh, explanations that appeal to, that say religions have come about because they have improved the fitness of humans, either on an individual level or on a group level. And there's a lot of lively debate about you know, which one, or maybe on both levels, OK? Basic principle, if you're more fit, the gene culture complex that gave rise to that kind of belief or those kinds of behaviors are more likely to survive and outcompete others, and so they're more likely to persist, all right? Well, does that apply to beliefs or practices we call religious? Um, and a lot of scholars working in this area think so. And some of the stories go along these lines. Well, that religious people might be more cooperative with each other. That cooperation breeds better resource sharing. Better resource sharing improves fitness. And I've put up a little picture of uh, a kibbutz community in Israel for a reason, because a really sort of fascinating study done by uh, anthropologist Richard Sosis looked at these kibitz, kibitz communities in Israel, and he's also looked at uh, uh, historical communes in the United States and other kinds of places. And what he sees over and over again 
is that religious intentional communities like this tend to actually last longer than the secular ones. They tend to be more economically successful. And in one study, he managed to demonstrate that the success and was largely predicted by the trust level of the people living in the community. How much did they trust each other so that they're willing to cooperate, willing to take personal risk for the greater good? And that willingness to trust each other and take those kinds of risks was predicted by whether the men prayed together or not. Okay, I did say men, not women, in this context because uh, in, this, in this Jewish context, women just typically don't pray together. Um, so that was not a variable that mattered. But whether the men did or not seemed to matter a lot. In other communities, they looked like, he's looked at, for instance, in uh, uh, different kinds of communes and other kinds of communities that sprung up in the 19th century in the United States. He looked at things like what, how sort of demanding were the entry rituals, if you will, to join the community. And the higher the cost, the more likely they were to survive if they were religious. Okay, why, why, why might that be? Because maybe these rituals, maybe praying together in a collective way, maybe going through initiation rituals, think hazing, um, signals to everyone else, I'm really in. Signals, no, I'm committed to the same values you are. And I see you doing it and you see me doing it. And we're doing something that, yeah, it's a little uncomfortable, it might be embarrassing, it might even be painful, it might be financially costly but I'm signaling to everybody else and I'm doing it anyway because I'm so committed. Now he's not suggesting, none of these theorists are suggesting people are necessarily consciously doing this. But that context, social context that allow us to demonstrate our common commitments to a set of values or to a common God might actually help pull us together in a really natural sort of way and help those communities outcompete other communities. There's other research that suggests that, you know, that uh, uh, the worship of certain kinds of gods even helped uh, ancient uh, bands, communities, civilizations in warfare. And so they're literally outcompeting others. Um, it may also be that just having gods around who are morally interested in you, as I suggested last night, and there are reminders of those gods' presence, maybe through idols, maybe through eye spots, maybe through prayer or ritual, signals, hey, remember that God who cares about how we treat each other? <laughs> Which helps us inhibit our selfish behaviors. And there's a little bit of research that suggests that contention as well. And so in this religion as adaptation space, there are a lot of folks who've been suggesting though, that maybe these things that we're recognizing as religions arose in part because and maybe they're sustained in part because they helped people get along. They helped regulate societies, especially once society started getting big enough that you just couldn't rely on uh, direct reciprocation. I'll give you something, you give me something later. And they couldn't rely just on family bonds. Once you're getting bigger communities than that, you needed other gadgets to hold people together. And maybe religion did that through a combination of signaling, reminding people of moral commitments, and, as we were just talking about outside, uh, ritualized behaviors of different sorts. Um, since not everyone is in on the conversation, and I thought it was pretty fun, one of the thing that, one uh, interesting human dynamic that uh, evolutionary uh, psychologists have, especially Robin Dunbar and his team, have uh, considered is how it is that humans hold together such big social groups. We are really unusual species in that we have big groups of individuals, individuals that we interact with in special ways, okay? As opposed to say herd animals. And you go down you know, to the African plains and you'll find thousands of zebra all hanging out together. But they're not individuating each other and treating each other in special ways. We do that with lots of different individuals. We treat them differently. We bond with them on a one-to-one -one kind of level. Well, how do we pull that off? Well, other primates, at least part of how they pull that off is by social grooming, literally picking bugs off of each other 
and you get, you know, you get protein, but you also get that sort of <laughs> uh, contact that re releases endorphins and other happy hormones that he helps to build bonds of trust, cooperation, okay? Well, we can't do that with humans. First of all, it would be socially frowned upon. We all start picking bugs off of each other. Note, though, that you do see this behavior, especially in women, girls, will brush each other's hair and things like that. So it's not unheard of in humans. And we do touch. We pat each other on the back, give, give hugs, handshakes, and that does some of the work, too. But we can't do that with everybody in our social network on a regular basis. But we can do other things that have been suggested release endorphins as well, like laugh together and engage in ritualized behaviors together, sing together, dance together. Those seem to do similar kinds of things. And maybe religious contexts actually help trigger that kind of social bonding as well. And this is part of the story is religion as adaptation. But then there's an, sort of another whole category of explanations. And they are religions or religiousness as evolutionary byproducts. And actually, the story I gave you last night the sort of my version of the born believers or the naturalness thesis is actually a byproduct theory. Now, byproduct sounds like something you don't want, that you want to throw away. But in this context, byproduct, all it means is not an adaptation. So Scott Atrian says religions are not adaptations and they have no evolutionary function as such in his 2002 book, In Gods We Trust. Here, the thought is that there are these other adaptations, like for understanding human minds, like for, um, uh, I don't know, our, our disgust mechanism for uh, avoiding uh, uh, things that could harm us, um, our um, ability to see utility, usefulness in natural things in the world, that design reasoning or teleofunctional reasoning that arose for entirely other reasons, okay? You have all of these sorts of mental tools that, it, that are their own adaptations. And they give rise to sort of effervesces out of that, these ideas about gods, for instance, or afterlife, or spirits, or ancestors, okay? And they get joined up into social systems for various reasons. But they don't necessarily make people more fit or adaptive, okay? So to remind you of some of the particulars and give a little bit more detail on one that I glossed last night quickly, um, one of the earliest sort of attempts in this direction was by uh, anthropologist Stuart Guthrie. In the, he had a 1980 paper where he argued that religion is basically anthropomorphism. Big fancy word meaning casting the world, the natural world, in human-like terms. It's an old idea. But his new take on it was that he placed it in kind of an evolutionary and cognitive framework. He said, look, it's really helpful and adaptive for people to understand the world in human-like terms. We're social beings. We're minded beings. We interact with other minded beings. It's a really, that, of course, is really important. And it kind of spills over in thinking about stuff in the world. Um, seeing design and purpose is helpful. Um, Detecting when there might be other intentional-minded beings around, whether they're human or not, is so important, it's so critical for our survival and reproduction that whatever mental system does that is kind of overly aggressive or hypersensitive. All right? And the argument goes along these lines. If you are an ancient hunter-gatherer, and uh, so imagine two ancient hunter-gatherers. One has a sort of ordinary, really sort of narrowly tuned uh, mental gadget for detecting intentional beings, human-like beings in the environment. One has a really sort of loose and juicy one, <laughs> OK? It's inclined to find them. When in doubt, yeah, there is one here. Well, this guy over here, here's rustling in the bushes and goes, insufficient evidence to conclude it's a, it's a threat. That guy runs away. This guy becomes Tiger Chow. OK? I mean, that's kind of Guthrie's picture here, in a sense, is that this system is tuned towards false positives because the costs of missing 
either an enemy who's in camouflage or a big predator is so great that you better assume that they're around until you know otherwise. He thinks this system may actually make us assume that there are other unseen agents around until proven otherwise, including ancestors, forest spirits, and maybe even gods. Okay? But notice he's not saying that we had this adaptation for gods. He's saying we've got an adaptation for avoiding predators, avoiding enemies, finding other people very quickly and rapidly. And it happens to spin off as a byproduct, belief in gods, spirits, and so forth. You with me? So that's a byproduct kind of explanation. And then last night I was talking about Deborah Kellerman's work on what you might call intuitive theism, or this teleofunctional reasoning, the design bias. Preschoolers look like they're inclined to see the world as purposefully designed, and they think an intentional agent being behind that natural design makes a lot of sense. It just sort of, oh yeah, that fits. Intuitively. I'm not saying they're reasoning to that explicitly, just it intuitively makes sense. And I mentioned that this, this predilection, or bias, persists into adulthood, unless it gets unlearned. She's done really clever experiments with adults, even science-trained adults, even PhD in science holding adults, showing that if she makes them answer very quickly, those kinds of explanations uh, for the natural world, like earthworms tunnel through the, uh, uh, to the soil to aerate it, Okay, do earthworms tunnel through the soil to aerate it? Something sounds wrong there, doesn't it? Earthworms do aerate the soil. They do tunnel through it. Their tunneling does aerate the soil, but they don't tunnel through the soil to aerate it. And most of us, when we stop and think, we go, yeah, yeah that's not a good explanation for the tunneling of earthworms. But if you make people answer very quickly, those sound pretty good. They seem to tap our affinity for thinking in terms of design, purpose, and teleology. So she's done some really cool experiments showing just that in even science-trained adults. Um, and then, of course, people know, uh, children know by the time they're four that people don't uh, create the natural world, and so they're left looking for other explanations, as it were. So that's, those are examples of byproduct types of accounts. Um, oh, wow, I'm missing a slide, it looks like. Rats. Where did I put it? Oh, nuts. Okay, I accidentally dropped one. Um, sorry about that. There are also what are sometimes called exaptation explanations. So I said there are adaptationist explanations, there are byproduct ones, and there are exaptationist explanations. Now, exaptation is just a... It's, it's, it sounds a little bit like adaptation, <laughs> and it is a lot like adaptation. The difference is it's assuming that something that arose for one reason then gets co-opted or exapted for another reason. Okay, so Jesse Baring's work actually shows imprints of this kind of thinking. It says, look, we've got this really hyperactive social mind that is a little bit like what Guthrie says, that's out there finding design, it's finding purpose, it's attributing uh, mental states to natural things in the world. That arose for reasons completely independent of religion. But once they start bubbling up, once the idea that there are ancestors around or morally interested gods or spirits of some sort, those make us behave better. And then that gets reinforced. Okay? Because people who behave better are more trusted. Being afraid of supernatural punishment makes you behave a little better, and then other people trust you more. And when other people trust you more, you get into better resource sharing relationships. Okay? People will give you stuff because they know you'll pay them back later instead of just cheating them. People will invite you to join them in you know, risky adventures, and you often hear these sort of, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, these funny scenarios about things like, okay, the men are out on a hunting party in the, uh, you know, in the, sometime during the Pleistocene era, and there's a mammoth, and 
Well, that's what we're going to try to bring down, but it takes eight people to bring down a mammoth, and it's high risk, and it's dangerous, and all of that, but, and everybody's got to be in their right place. And if a rabbit runs by, well, it might be pretty tempting just to grab that rabbit for yourself, because that's low risk, and then you can have the rabbit and the mammoth too. But if you leave your post, and if everybody leaves their post, then you'll never get the mammoth. Ah, oh, no, we've got a cooperative problem here. It's in everybody's best interest to try to grab the individual best interest, to try to grab the rabbit instead of paying attention to the mammoth. But if everybody does that, then we all miss out on the mammoth. Oh, no. We need people who uh, know that the gods are watching, so don't grab the rabbit, but, you know, cooperate. I need to be able to know who I should pick for my hunting party that I can trust. They're not going to leave their post and go after a rabbit when we're trying to bring down a mammoth. I'm off. I'm off. Sounds like a caveman word too, doesn't it? Okay, you see the kind of puzzle there. And one suggestion is that once people had these ideas about spirits around, that helped them resist the temptation to defect from their group. And people started picking up on it. That's an exaptation. Okay, so those are the kinds, uh, and of course these things can be, uh, these explanations can be combined up in various ways too. Here's an example. Suppose we've got this evolved mental tool that concerns minds, just like I was talking about, and, um, but it, uh, as uh, Yale psychologist Paul Bloom has argued, um, it actually doesn't care too much about bodies. So our system in our minds for thinking about other people's minds is a different system than the one that worries about how bodies work. And because of that, the two have different developmental pathways, they have different input conditions, they have different output conditions, which means, says Bloom, that when somebody dies, our thinking about their minds can keep on going very easily. It doesn't shut down automatically. And maybe that helps give rise to these beliefs in afterlife. And then we have this agency detection device that I mentioned, this sort of hypersensitivity to assume there's an agent if there's only scant behavior, uh, sorry, scant evidence. And that agency detection device has funny little experiences like these auditory hallucinations of a deceased loved one that reinforces the idea that there's a spirit present. Okay, you're following me? And then it turns out that people with this tendency to believe in ancestor spirits are more trustworthy and cooperative. Well, then their genetic package, and maybe even their cultural package, is more likely to get reinforced because they have better fitness. So you can combine pieces from all of these different kinds of explanations. All right? You with me? And I'm going fast, and it's, you know, it's sleepy time of the day still for a lot of us, especially if we're on Pacific time. Uh, right, those are the kinds of explanations on offer in this contemporary cognitive and evolutionary studies of religion. And so then back to our question, do these explanations of religion explain beliefs in a way? Now I want you to, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. I want you to notice something. That these different explanations were picking at different kinds of features of religions. Right? Some of them, you know, I mentioned uh, belief in ghosts or ancestors or forest spirits or the intuitive theism stuff might, you know, the seeing uh, design and purpose in the natural world might lead you to believe in a creator kind of God. But that talk about signaling commitments might be more to do with participating in rituals. These are not all the same thing, are they? They're all different phenomena that I just very quickly put in one bucket. I'm bringing your attention to this because there isn't an explanation of religion on offer. Okay? A really important point. Um, the causes for the beliefs in a ghost in Hampton Court outside of London may be entirely different than beliefs in an afterlife. The causes for belief in an afterlife may be entirely different than the reasons why people participate in ritualized behaviors. 
And that may be entirely different than the reasons why people believe in a creator God, or two or three. They're not all the same thing from a scientific perspective. And the point that I want to make there very clearly is from this kind of a scientific perspective, the category of religion is at best a heuristic category. There is no such thing as religion from this perspective. Okay? Maybe surprising. Don't, don't let it be too unnerving. We use lots of what I'll call folk categories or concepts in day-to-day -day life very well. And they're handy. And they're, you know, for what they do, they're good. That doesn't make them good scientific concepts. Tree is one of those examples. Okay, I think we can all, generally, we would have a high degree of agreement in pointing out what things are trees and what things aren't. But botanists tell us it's actually not a very handy category as a botanist. Landscapers may like the idea of tree just fine. Um, common folk may like it just fine. But botanists apparently don't care for it because it doesn't pick out a group of things out there in the world that have common causes or common effects. It's not, the tree is not a natural kind. Surprising? Okay. Um, fruit is another one of these weird categories. What we as ordinary people call fruit is not necessarily the same thing that botanists call fruit. There's some overlap, but they're not identical. And then that's not the same as what may be fruit for tax purposes. Okay? Sometimes, I mean, uh, you know, kids can be really kind of fun and annoying when they learn things in school like, uh, you know, that uh, tomato is a fruit, not a vegetable. Um, that's fine unless you're in particular jurisdictions who have ruled that for tax purposes, you know, it's a vegetable. Um, this happens all the time. So what I'm pointing to is that for some reasons, like just ordinary going through life, or for landscaping, or for jurisprudence, we may use categories and labels in different way than scientists do. Religion is one of those, at least I'd argue it ought to be one of those. Okay? There is no such thing as religion from a scientific perspective. That's controversial, by the way. I'll flag that. I'm not alone in that contention, but lots of people who say that they study religion think it's a thing. Um, but I will note, what's on my side is history. For 150 years, people have been trying to study religion sort of in a semi-scientific way, and there is no consensus on what it is. Okay? If you try to find definitions of religion, you will find literally hundreds of these things. They tend to group in certain categories, but nobody knows what it is. And I suspect that's because it isn't in it, at least not on that level. Okay, why is he going on about that? Because if religion is not a thing, if it's sort of a, a, a loose category that just points us in a general direction of lots of different things, then we should be suspicious of any sweeping explaining away religion claim. If it isn't a thing, you can't explain it away through scientific causes. Of course, you can't affirm it through science either, because it isn't an it. You follow me? But, having said all of that, we might think, well, okay, fine, Barrett. But still, we're not interested in religion. What about belief in gods? Well, maybe that's what we can explain away. So I'll focus there mostly. Um, after dispensing with a couple of examples that show, no, this is, this is a live conversation out there. Uh, one kind of group of explaining away uh, attempts kind of go along these lines, especially in re reaction to the born believers thesis. Um, here's a nice little quote. Uh, one major difference between Santa Claus and God, obviously, is that no adult believes in Santa Claus, and unfortunately, a great many adults believe in God. It's about time they grew up and tossed God aside at about the same age that they tossed Santa Claus aside. Um, Sigmund Freud was famous for arguing that people really ought to get over God, because that's just childishness. Okay? And then, then this guy Barrett comes along and writes this book, Born Believers, and it sure looks like he's providing evidence that, yeah, this is, this is kid stuff. 
religion is kid stuff. So on those grounds, shouldn't we think that uh, maybe this, this scientific research has suggested we ought to get away, with, get away from it? Well, not obvious to me. And interestingly, it's from a, precisely this sort of evolutionary developmental perspective that makes me think, no, that's not good enough as an explaining away. And why not? So I've written Evo Devo on the slide. That's sort of shorthand for this little field that's grown up called evolutionary stroke developmental psychology. And it takes evolutionary perspectives and looks at human development. And one of the, th the recurring themes in this area over and over again is the things that are most important to human survival and fitness typically have precursors in early childhood. Because it's the really important stuff that gets a leg up in life. Like language acquisition, like bonding with your mother, like uh, learning how to read human faces, like learning how to learn. All of those things are childish things. Learning not to hit other people, learning how to obey people in authority. Those are childish things. All of these have precursors in early childhood. Heck, understanding how the physical world works and how you know, objects move, that's an early childhood thing. So just calling something childish or saying there's sort of early natural predispositions in the direction isn't good enough, if you, unless you want to get rid of pretty much everything that's important to being a human being. Um, and there are, of course, other differences here, too, between Santa Claus and God. Typically, religious beliefs, like beliefs in God or the ancestors or angels or saints or whatever it is, are typically reaffirmed or even arrived at in adulthood. Yes, it's true that children often have invisible friends that then they outgrow. But that is not true here, and the two are not related to each other. Okay, you might think, well, invisible friends, don't they just become you know, spirits or gods? No. Children actually, interestingly, as their belief in sort of magic and just weird kinds of superstitions declines, their belief in the power of prayer increases. They don't think these are the same thing. Uh, Jackie Woolley at University of Texas has shown this. I think what's really going on here is that some uh, science popularizers just want to call religious people childish. It's an ad hominem attack. And it's also playing on what's called the genetic fallacy. Right? If the origins of something look dubious, then it must be bad or false. And uh, philosophers generally call that a fallacy for good reason. It just doesn't follow. OK, what about a slightly more interesting move here? This is from Jesse Baring, uh, who I referenced earlier as an exaptationist. And he writes in his book, The Belief Instinct, so it would appear that having a theory of mind was so useful for our ancestors in explaining and predicting other people's behaviors that it has completely flooded our evolved social brains. And then goes on, so that's sort of a summary of his theory. And then he goes on to say, what if I were to tell you that God's mental states too were all in your mind, that God was in fact a psychological illusion, a sort of evolved blemish etched onto the core substrate of your brain? It may feel as if there's something grander out there, watching, knowing, caring, perhaps even judging. But in fact, that's just your overactive theory of mind. In reality, there's only the air you breathe. OK, that he put these claims, his summary of his theory, and then this claim side by side suggests that he thinks there's some kind of a logical connection there. Uh, I went through his book fairly carefully, and I, I failed to find such an argument actually articulated. But I've interacted with. I've known Jesse Baring for a long time, and I've, I've had the opportunity to be on a panel with him and talk about these things. And so I know he thinks there's a connection. But mostly, the only connection he sees is that there's something natural here, so we should be suspicious. Well, that too is that genetic fallacy. Okay, Just because something has a natural origin, or even a byproduct origin, doesn't automatically mean it's false or wrong, or not of value. Science itself is not an adaptation. It's a byproduct. Right? Most of our moral systems are byproducts. Our governmental systems are byproducts. So just because you're a byproduct, an evolutionary byproduct, doesn't mean much on whether uh, you should continue to believe it's uh, the, these byproduct kinds of beliefs. All right? Giving you some heavy philosophical kind of stuff here this morning. 
That's because I think these are the kinds of problems. I don't want people to walk away thinking that uh, the arguments do one thing and they don't. A um, little bit more sophisticated arguments. I've, I've grabbed these basic outlines from philosopher Michael Murray, who has looked carefully at this area. Um, and so I'm going to summarize just a couple of more interesting ones. Now, one of those might be called the error-prone system argument. And the argument basically goes this way. He says, well, look, cognitive devices, like say this agency detection system or this tendency towards anthropomorphism or this tendency toward uh, uh, attributing design and purpose to the natural world, whatever the system, we'll, we'll just call it ADD for agency detection device, either spawns or nurtures theistic beliefs. That is, it's one of the causes in the causal chain of theistic beliefs, beliefs in God. Experimental evidence and evolutionary considerations give us reason to think that it, this system, generates false positives. That is, it finds stuff where there isn't stuff. Because it generates false positives, it's unreliable. Beliefs spawned or nurtured by an unreliable mechanism are unjustified. Hence, theistic beliefs are unjustified. Okay? It's a pretty straightforward kind of argument. But then Murray goes on to critique the, his own argument that he's uh, generated here. He says, OK, well, hold on. Uh, belief forming mechanisms like this agency detection device or whatever bag of tricks is giving rise to these religious beliefs will vary in their reliability with context. What he's getting at is things like, well, consider the visual system. Under the current conditions in here, because the lighting isn't great, um, I, but, but there is still some light. I could probably arrive at a reasonable sort of count of the number of people in this room. But I might miss a few people in the back row because it's kind of dark back there. My visual system is not entirely reliable under these conditions. And if we dropped these lights, suddenly it would be really unreliable. Right? But if we turned all the house lights up, it would be plenty reliable for detecting human beings unless they're hiding in this space. So what he's pointing to is whatever systems we typically use to form beliefs are going to vary in their reliability depending on context factors. That has to be part of the argument. So if this agency detection device produces religious beliefs in context in which it is reliable, then those beliefs aren't suspect because it was formed by that device. If it if these religious beliefs are produced in contexts where, where this agency detection device is unreliable, then of course those would be suspect. Okay, Just like if we turned all the lights off and then I told you how many people were in here. You know, well, why, why would you trust me? How could I possibly know? Okay. So he's saying we need to know the particular context of this theistic belief formation and the particular reliability of the cognitive mechanisms in that context. And we simply don't know those things. And he's absolutely right about that. No one has a clue about those particulars. Um, furthermore, I don't know that we ever will. And it's not because I'm not an optimist when it comes to research. It's because <clears throat> how would we know whether our device for detecting minded intentional beings is ever accurate? I mean, the way, how do I know that you all have minds? I'm not trying to insult anyone. I'm just saying, I can't see your mind. I can't see your consciousness. I can see your bodies. But as far as I know, you may be cleverly designed robots or figments of my imagination or remote controlled by somebody else or zombies. I don't know. Okay? I, 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 in any sort of absolutely confident kind of way. The only way that I know is I have some kind of cognitive gadget in my head that when I look at each of you, I see a minded being automatically. Well, that's the device we're trying to test right now. It's its own straight edge, so we never know if it's true in an absolute sense. That's at least part of my concern, um, among others. We also don't yet know what role any of these particular mechanisms play entirely in the generation of particular religious beliefs. 
Guthrie has given us reason to think that, yeah, okay, maybe something like this is at play in religious beliefs of some sort, but this one? Or that one? Or that one? Or that one? We don't know. It may be that this agency detection device is really important for generating the idea that the house at the end of the street is haunted. But really not important at all in generating the belief that there's a creator God. So we don't know which of these beliefs would be suspect, even if we knew for sure that this agency detection device was error prone. And it could be that it's actually not error prone. It could be that it gets things right most of the time. We just don't. So those kinds of considerations lead Murray to say, okay, well, wait a minute. Maybe there's another way to crack this nut. Fine, we don't know the perfect accuracy of these cognitive systems in and of themselves, but we do know one thing about them. Whatever cognitive tools are involved in spawning religious beliefs, one thing is clear. The beliefs spawned are obviously mutually incompatible. Okay, any cognitive tool which gives rise to mutually incompatible beliefs in this way are obviously unreliable, and beliefs arising from them would have to be taken to be unjustified, at least absent some sort of independent evidence of their truth. As a result, religious beliefs arising from these tools cannot reasonably accepted, be accepted absent independent justification. What he's getting at here is there are so many different religious beliefs that seem to be generated by the same mechanisms that are mutually incompatible, that they're not the same, that can't all be true, so then that device seems to be untrustworthy or unreliable, right? So if, uh, I, I, back to vision, if there were five of us standing on this stage and we all came up with different counts of the number of people in the room, you would say, well, something's wrong with, say, your vision or counting systems, right? Because they're generating mutually incompatible outputs. So I'm not sure that these, either the conditions or the mechanisms are actually reliable to form a belief of the sort of how many people are in the room. Make sense? Um, but then Mer Murray makes this kind of observation about his own argument once again, because philosophers do this kind of stuff. They create an argument and then they attack their own arguments. And then they create a new one and then they go after that one too. It's kind of fun. Uh, they fight themselves. You put them in a room by themselves and they're But it's, you know, it's useful for the rest of us so we don't have to get our, our mitts dirty. Uh, so Murray grants that religious beliefs across times and cultures are largely mutually inconsistent or incompatible, but suggests that these incompatibilities arise not arise from cultural sources and not from the basic natural functionings of human minds. So you could almost think of it this way. Is natural cognition drives a belief in something, like, hey, there's some kind of a god around here. But then it's cultural particulars that label that god, that fill in the details. And that's where the diversity lies. So the error isn't here, it's here. The diversity isn't here, it's here. Make sense? And so then we don't say, well, then this stuff is untrustworthy. We say, well, no, it's this stuff that maybe is leading to untrustworthy stuff. But what's that? That's culture, that's reflection, that's people talking to each other, that's all kinds of thinking. Well, that's just ordinary stuff. Uh, we'll skip that one. Um, I think in part what he's getting at is this idea that even though there may be thousands of gods that people talk about just in India, <laughs> let alone the rest of the world, uh, what people are, people are not strictly exclusivist about these things, okay? In India, for instance, one way of handling this enormous diversity of gods is saying they're all manifestations of the same god. Or that's your perspective on this god. But there's just one. Or some, some people would say, no, there really are thousands. And that's okay, they all exist. You detected that one? Yeah, I detected this one over here. Not a problem. Just like there can be lots of hauntings in different houses all over the place. That doesn't mean they're mutually incompatible, just because we disagree on the details. Um, consider moral truths in this regard. I think a lot of us think that some things really are right and some things really are wrong, but there's obviously cross-cultural disagreement about which particular things are right and wrong. But that people disagree about the particulars 
shouldn't make us give up entirely on some things being right and wrong, right? Because it does look like there are general patterns. Okay, generally it's not okay to murder your mother in her sleep. I think most people would agree on that. There may be very particular places where, no, nah, no, nah, it's all right, you know, she had it coming for this reason and that reason, or whatever it is, and we might go, well, I don't know, I don't feel good about that. Oh, well, diversity of beliefs. Well, you can't trust your mind, I can't trust mine. Uh, I don't think we want to go down the road. Uh, he may, Maria may also be getting at, I don't know if you can see very well this picture here. What you've got here is a tree. Yeah, I know, I said there are no such thing as trees. Uh, but there's this tree here that has these big scratch marks on it. So imagine I'm, um, I don't know, a, a, a British uh, explorer type guy, and I've got three friends. And one's a North American outdoorsman, and one is a, a, an Asian outdoorsman, and one is an African outdoorsman. And we have gone to the Amazon, and we see a tree like this, Amazon being in South America, not near, not where any, th any of us are from. Okay, that was the point of that. And we see this tree, and the North American says, a bear has been here recently. We better get out of here. The African says, no, 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 no. Clearly, a lion has been here. We better get out of here. The Asian says, no, 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 no. A tiger has been here. We better get out of here. And the wise, wise guy that I am, I say, well, wait a minute, you guys can't agree. I'm going to stay right here. All right, take my point. I think maybe that's what we're talking about. Just because there's a disagreement doesn't mean there isn't some common core that actually might be truth tracking in some way. But we don't know. OK. One last sort of group of arguments here are these sort of no causal connection arguments. And then in some ways they're more interesting. You may have noticed that I've been explaining religion or religious ideas, practices, beliefs, and so forth without reference to the actual existence of gods, spirits, ancestors, the afterlife. I've just been leaving that on the shelf, I've been remaining agnostic about that in the sake, for the sake of these explanations. Okay? So then Murray observes this. Well, look, maybe somebody who wants to say this. Cognitive science of religion or these other kinds of accounts can account for the origin of religious belief in a way that makes no reference to and requires no causal connection with supernatural reality. However, properly justified belief requires that the target of the belief be causally connected to belief itself in certain ways. Since these accounts show us that none of those ways are in fact in play in the origins of religious belief, Beliefs so generated are unjustified. What he has in mind is, the, is this kind of scenario where for me to have a proper belief that I am in North Georgia, it needs to be somehow connected to the fact that I am in North Georgia. And then it's a properly justified belief. But if I find out that I've taken a pill, it's the North Georgia pill, and anybody who takes it thinks that they're in North Georgia, if I discover that I have taken such a pill, then that should undercut my belief that I'm in North Georgia right now. Make sense? Because that pill doesn't have the proper causal connection to the reality. Okay? Does that kind of make sense? You say, well, maybe there's something at play here. If our causal mechanisms would make us believe in God anyway, whether or not there's a God, then we've got a problem. Maybe they really do undermine our belief in God, or in the afterlife, or in spirits. Okay? That kind of makes sense? Now, there is an answer available to somebody who's defending belief in God. It might go along these lines. Well, look, it's true that these scientific explanations haven't made reference to God, but that's because, but, but God's active anyway. God is causally relevant. God has orchestrated the natural order to produce such a beliefs. So philosopher Alvin Plantinga puts it this way, to show that there are natural processes that produce religious belief does nothing to discredit it. Perhaps God designed us in such a way that it's by virtue of those processes that we come to have knowledge of him. 
So what you're seeing there is the suggestion of an indirect cause, maybe. Okay? And Murray used this kind of a, an illustration. Suppose that, um, I'll, I'll do my own sort of derivation of this, but suppose that uh, when uh, Bill contacted me about coming to speak, he got an email message from somebody saying, yeah, he'll, he'll do this. And Bill formed the belief that I was actually coming. Even though he'd never talked directly to me. Okay? It wasn't the Justin Baird is coming to speak Bill. It's not exactly that, right? Bill was justified in forming his belief because the person he talked to, okay, he only talked through electronic media, you know, through email, claimed to have a connection to me. And usually that's good enough for us, okay? We don't usually, for at least a lot of beliefs, don't have the direct causal sort of connection to the object. We have an indirect one. Just like if there's an election going on, you know, it's election season, and uh, you get a computer-generated phone call that says, vote for Mortimer Snurd for county commissioner. You form a belief that Mortimer Snurd is running for county commissioner, even though you know perfectly well Mortimer Snurd was not on the phone. But you do believe that there Somewhere behind the causal chain of events was Mortimer Snurd. Maybe asking a volunteer to set up this calling system that then gets set up and then calls you. So while God may not be the direct cause of the belief, but because the belief may be mediated through our cognitive mechanisms, God is in the causal chain, and that's good enough. Now, I want to note that this kind of a defense is not available to all religious beliefs, as far as I can tell. So it's hard to imagine that, uh, I don't know, the afterlife set up my cognitive system so that I would believe in the afterlife. Or certain kinds of local ghosts and things, maybe you know, the ghost at the end of the street, didn't, wasn't part of the creation that led to my mind being such that I would detect a ghost at the end of the street. Okay? So it's not clear that all beliefs that we would call religious necessarily sort of get off the hook through this kind of defense. But it looks like a god could get off the hook, as it were. At least in that indirect cause response. But there is another sort of avenue, and it goes this way. Well, Sure, these scientific accounts don't make reference to the actual existence of God or ancestor spirits or forest spirits or whatever it is. But maybe if those things didn't exist, we, the explanations would be insufficient. What do you mean? Well, I, and I'm not saying I'm committed to these things. I'm just saying we should explore the logical possibilities of things like, and I've, had, I've seen this kind of an explanation. Well, look. Um, If uh, the, you, you guys, you cognitive scientists of religion people say that people believe in, say, uh, forest spirits because they've got this hypersensitive agency detection device that every once in a while says, ooh, I think there's a spirit here or there's something here. I don't know what it is. It doesn't seem to be visible. It has these properties. A few of us have those kinds of experiences. We get together and talk and say, oh, maybe it's a spirit. And we go, well, it kind of makes sense for all of the things we've observed. Wow, all right. And then other people detect similar kinds of stuff. They go, ooh, the spirit. I ran into the spirit in the forest. And then we do rituals, and it improves our hunting success. And we go, hmm, must be the spirits. And off we go. Well, you wouldn't have had those spirit experiences if there weren't actually spirits. Again, I'm not claiming there are, but someone could easily argue that. Because all, we don't know if all by themselves these cognitive mechanisms or evolutionary stories would actually come out the way they do. Maybe these gods, spirits, ancestors, souls, afterlife, are part of the background conditions that are simply being ignored by these scientific accounts. But they are real and operative. A little bit like maybe even though we can give a pretty good explanation of why, other, why we think each other have minds, without reference to the actual existence of minds, but maybe, maybe those explanations wouldn't work if you didn't have minds. We just don't know, all right? So we should be open-minded about that. Ah, uh, that's terrible, that's terrible. Okay, what I've tried to do is 
convince you that there are many different kinds of scientific explanations available that are in this space of various kinds of beliefs. Because they're so diverse, varied, they're picking out different kinds of features, among other considerations, from a scientific perspective, there is no coherent explanation of religion. From a scientific perspective, religion isn't a thing. Because it isn't a thing, there is no one explaining away or universal affirming of religion from a scientific perspective. You, we shouldn't expect one. If we hear, oh, science has explained away religion, be suspect. Okay? Somebody doesn't know what they're talking about on a certain level. But then we, start, we considered some very particular kinds of things about what about explanations uh, of, of specific sorts, adaptationist ones, exaptationist ones, byproduct ones, explaining very particular kinds of beliefs like ancestors, afterlife, souls, gods. Do they explain away? Do they, raise, do they provide evidence that undercuts the, the reasons for belief? And at this point, I I actually have not come across any convincing arguments of that sort. And so it is at least my tentative view right now, that maybe with a couple of weak exceptions that I already uh, signaled, these scientific explanations are not explaining away most religious beliefs at this point, at least not most of those that are commonly held. Okay, but if you're interested in these kinds of topics, here are a couple of books that take, these are both edited collections that take up these kinds of problems written by lots of philosophers and things like that who are wrestling with explanation in this space and what its implications are for whether or not religious beliefs are justified. Thank you very much. How are we doing? Yes, apparently we have time for questions, discussion, hostilities, stretching. I know I turned down the house lights, it's like great mid-morning nap. <laughs> okay, if there's no immediate questions, uh, why don't we go over and uh, the break should be set up. Yeah, okay, I'm sorry. So I guess uh, something that's interesting to speculate if we you know, could travel back in time and go to the Paleolithic era and see if there was some commonalities between all, what all the people that lived then believed. Uh, I, I think there's a theory that animism, mm. which is you know, very similar to your I I intuitive theism, I believe, was, was that kind of like the default belief of people that lived so so long ago, and then other other belief systems like polytheism emerged from that as as culture developed. But uh, is is animism, which which I think is also common in some of the indigenous societies that, that anthropologists study, is is that kind of the default belief, and, and is that a clue to uh, un, unlocking these mysteries? Good, good, great question. Yeah, there is a common kind of narrative about the sort of the prehistory of religion um, that Fraser's Golden Bough really popularized, as far as I can tell. Um, not an expert in history of the idea, but it basically runs along the lines that you just heard. So it's thought that the earliest religions were some kind of animism, this idea that uh, rocks and trees and rivers and animals all have these spirits. And everything is sort of has intentional agency in it one way or another. And then this sort of develops into more of a polytheism kind of idea where you've got, well, no, okay, you've got a particular river spirit and you've got a particular sort of forest spirit over there and then you've got these other kinds of things and maybe ancestors and so forth. And then you get this sort of clumping into these sort of big gods that, uh, well, it turns out people start thinking, well, you've got all of these sort of local deities. Really, they're just sort of manifestations of all one thing. And maybe we need a high creator there or something that sort of is behind it all. And so then you get these theistic systems. So often, and the reason, it's not for no reason that people have thought that, but usually it's an extrapolation from existent human groups. So under the assumption that hunter-gatherer groups that uh, we've experienced 
interacted with in recorded history are most like the oldest human groups, well, they tend to be look animistic and so forth and so on. And the bigger scale your societies, the sort of more you get this clumping of first from sort of diffused animism to actual gods, little g, and then to big gods. Um, actually, I don't think we've got real strong reason to think that that's the right story, frankly. Um, that we don't have real strong reason to think that's the wrong story. We just don't have real strong reason. Uh, from an intuitive perspective, I actually think that there's reason to suspect that this kind of diffused animism is not the default, that maybe something like polytheism is. Um, that's not to say there aren't some intuitive anchors for this animism idea. So animism traffics more on this idea of forces, life forces, for instance, than minded beings. And definitely, there is developmental research that suggests that this idea of a life force, or you know, in, in Asian religions, you hear chi, as in tai chi, you know, chi, this sort of life force, is a common concept all over the place. And it looks like it's pretty intuitive in kids. What's interesting is it doesn't get culturally developed in a lot of Western society, whereas it gets developed really well in the East. So it's a, it's a fun example. So the anchor seems to be there for animism. But this idea that um, rocks are just as animated as trees, are just as animated as uh, butterflies, birds, and dogs, most of the development research suggests, nah, that kids actually would find that really peculiar. Um, they're very quick at sort of drawing lines between agents and non-agents and treating them as different kinds of things. Um, and you can kind of understand why that would be. If you think that all of the world is alive in, e in similar kinds of ways, well, it would be hard to predict its activity, its movement, its needs, and that kind of stuff. What do I get to eat and not and so forth? So my best guess is that animism as a belief system is actually has been more culturally developed than we appreciate. So there was this sort of old assumption in Fraser's time that, well, those primitive people haven't really thought about this stuff. So that's why it's all that into it. Actually, I think they did think about it, and they came to some pretty interesting and unusual kinds of directions. Um, and not all of them have what you know, we classically think of animism, but they're closer to polytheism. Um, so my money is on something that looks a little bit more like polytheism, but I'd be speculating too. And someone else would stand up and say, well, Barrett, here's why you're wrong. And I'd go, yeah, probably. <laughs> so I think we just don't know. But it's a really great question and, a, uh, and certainly a live area of inquiry. Because we really don't have that much evidence of what people believed in terms of artifacts. We have like perhaps the, the Lascaux paintings and yeah. in, in Neanderthal grave goods. But we're just speculating. We are speculating a lot. And uh, some of those cave paintings, too, uh, while they're commonly interpreted as religious or spiritual or something. Another a, a counter thesis is they're kind of ancient graffiti. Um, and that works pretty well, too, as an explanation. So I, we just don't know. And, and there's another way. I mean, in the recorded history, we do know something about the relationship between uh, monotheism and polytheism, though, or at least what looks like it. And it goes the opposite direction. So why did, I mean, we uh, lots of us have read at least classical literature, and you say, well, there are all these gods, the pantheon of the Greeks and Romans. Well, part of the reason for the pantheon is because you had empire. And, but their strategy for empire wasn't, OK, now you, now you have to adopt our god. It was like, OK, you have your god, and we'll just add them to the list. And that actually seems to be more the default move, right? This is why you have so many gods in India as well. The default move seems to be just adding gods. Um, but that doesn't mean you started with lots of gods. It means you probably started with a very small number of gods. You just kept adding them as you sort of, oh, hey, you've got a god too. I'm not sure it's the same as ours. OK, well, we'll just add them to the list. But so if you, anyway. <laughs> Would that be the same as denomination? No, I think we've got something different going on there. So my question may, may be taking us to a place where we don't want to go. But Excellent. It, it seems to me that all of these explanations 
are of certain characteristics or building blocks of religious belief. But it seems to me that the religious belief systems which ask our consideration grow out of inspired leaders who somehow had insights that appeal to something deeper. I mean, like take Hinduism, for instance. There's a huge religious philosophy that grew out of that, which begins to reinterpret all of these more basic systems to a higher level. It seems to me that this inspiration and this compelling nature of the inspired speaker is more relevant to the kind of religion we practice than these kind of like fundamental, these kind of more basic things like um, spirits or, or concepts of an afterlife. Yeah, great. Great, good observation. Um, I'll push back on a little bit of that. So part of my contention here is uh, you can have inspired leaders, um, teachers, if they try to teach something that doesn't come close enough to natural foundations, it's going to go nowhere. At least it won't last. So, but you actually built that into your comment. You said they appeal to something deeper. And I'd suggest that deeper is the sort of natural anchor points. Um, I liked your characterization of building blocks, too. Um, that's a good way to talk about this approach. And at a certain point, you've got to put the building blocks together. And I think that um, we have seen that, of course. And sometimes the building blocks get put together by people who are inspiring leaders who manage to see the connections and manage to tell a bigger story and put it together. I think that's right. Um, I think that's going to be part of the bigger story of uh, the origin and evolution of religions. And it's definitely the kind of world then that we are born into. Okay, So the claim that I'm making is that for, if, if you want to say abstract a system out there, a belief system, a theology if you will, if you want that to get picked up by ordinary folks, there have to be bridges. There has to be relevance. It has to make a difference. It has to have intuitive hooks. You, know, you want to talk about it in the, either in your head or in your heart um, so that it moves people, it motivates. And not just anything will do. Okay, So there's sometimes sort of tongue-in-cheek attempts at this. I predict that um, at least the Star Wars version of the Force, even though it's recognized as a religion apparently in one or more European countries, is not going to last. Because it was wholly invented for entertainment purposes. <laughs> and it, so it doesn't have the right kinds of hooks. But we've also seen other kinds of very serious religious movements sort of come and go. But usually it's because whatever they, they did successfully was trafficking on these other kinds of things. And then they got outcompeted by systems that did better, um, which is another part of the dynamic. And I, you, know, you, you actually had a very rich and layered question comment. So did I catch some of the main points there? Yeah, uh, it's a division of labor thing. Other people have done more of that kind of study. And so what w those of us working in the cognitive science of religion are doing is saying, OK, yeah, but why does that work? Um, why do the great leaders manage to be successful? What makes them great? Uh, I think the old story is, well, they're just so darn persuasive. Yeah, but there have been all kinds of persuasive people who've gone nowhere. Um, there are all kinds of ideas that just never got a start. Why is that? And why is it that you see certain kinds of patterns show up over and over and over again? Um, so, yeah, that's, that's where we're at. Good observation. Um, OK, here and then here. You've used a number of times the concept of intuition yeah. or intuitive knowing to, and, and the way that I hear it as to speak to um, some kind of deep-seated human knowing. I'm wondering if your concept of intuition, does it exist in the mind? Is that a product of the mind or is, there, is it something else? 
And if it's something else, how does that play into the cognitive conversation? Yeah, good. Uh, uh, in the neck of the woods I work in, we use intuition to refer to, uh, it, is a, it is part of the mind. It's part of that fast system in the mind. Our intuitions are the things that maybe are working in the background that we're not necessarily aware of as they're working. Um, the, the things that just seem so, for instance. That doesn't mean there isn't good reason. That doesn't mean we haven't built them in actually deliberately sometimes. But it's that really that quick, in fast, non-reflective kind of thought system that actually probably is most of how we navigate the world. That's what I'm trying to get at is intuition. You're right that it also has um, more of an affective or emotional dimension to it oftentimes. Not always, but sometimes. Um, so from last night, my illustrations about disgust are of that sort, right? Where we're just, oh, disgusting. Um, and in the moral domain, we see that a lot, where it looks like we have intuitions that something is wrong, even before we can articulate reasons. But I still think that's part of cognition generally. I've had a hard time following all of this, but I am going to react to the fact that I encounter a lot of people who are pushing back on religion, uh -huh. and therefore they fall back on uh, what I would like to hear more about from you about life force. You know, you said, well, the, the force be with you, and the game was a form of entertainment, but it sure got a lot of following. And, and in younger generations that I encounter, they, they don't want to talk about religion at all, but they do understand there's a connection. So there's something out there between all of us. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, does it have to turn into a religion in order for people to come together with a concept like this force? This thing that nobody wants to call anything in particular because they don't want to associate with a certain religion. Yeah, I think you're right. That right now what we're seeing is a reaction against organized lots of everything, <laughs> whether it's religions or even government structures or um, political parties. Um, right? There are more non-partisans now than ever in American history, as far as I can tell, um, which is interesting all by itself. There's, there's this... Um, a general social trend towards not committing to groups, to institutions. Um, so then the question is, uh, well, what about uh, things like force and so forth? Can people, uh, you know, to rework your question a little bit, can people be spiritual and religions not arise out of that? Um, uh, for a little while. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, you noted the can we have common beliefs about something like, oh, we're all connected to each other and some kind of transcendent something that glues us together? Well, yeah, we can share that idea, but we don't know that we share that idea until we start discussing that with each other. And once we start discussing that with each other, we start deciding who's got a better version of it than others. And then we start moving a little bit towards something that looks a little bit more like orthodoxy. And certain people are going to rise up as trusted, as having a little bit better access or be able to articulate the truth about these things a little better. And this is especially true if we're going to have any kind of community around these things. And community is important. We're fundamentally social animals. And so then we'll start doing things together around these kinds of topics. And that means then we're going to have certain practices. And some people are going to like some practices over other practices. And eventually, certain practices are going to be the preferred practices in this community, but maybe different ones in that community. And we're on our way back to religions again. Um, uh, we tend to be presentist about these things and impressed with things happening right now have never happened before. But of course, they have. Maybe not in the same scale and maybe not in the same way, but they have. And my guess, given that humans are social, given that we like to talk to each other, <laughs> that we like to interact with each other, and we can't do all of this online because it doesn't do the endorphin release I was talking about. It doesn't do the social grooming. So we actually need face-to-face -face interaction with people. If we didn't, you wouldn't have me here. Right? You would have just loaded up a, a YouTube video and stuck it up there or something. But we like to get together. We like to interact. We like to discuss. 
And that puts us back on the pathway toward at least lightly structured religious groups, I think. So wait for it. It's going to happen. <laughs> okay, I think there's a back here. Floyd, all the way back. Oh, you got one there? I find the whole area uh, very fascinating. Uh, I recently completed a research project on free will and is there free will and what is it? And uh, I dealt with evolutionary psychology and social psychology and to some extent with folklore. Uh, and I was attempting to understand the methodologies uh, and how they reached various conclusions, which was kind of all over the board. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when you uh, began, you used buttercup. <laughs> uh, a deductive categorical syllogism, and then you moved immediately into inductive logic. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, could you clarify your methodology? Uh, because I'm, I was waiting to hear, well, where did the deductive logic fit into the whole thing? Yeah, good, good. Uh, yeah, my point was that, um, I mean, we can use explicit articulated either deduction or induction as reasons to arrive at certain kinds of conclusions, including the, that the cat is furry. Um, but my suggestion is just because we can articulate arguments of that sort to reach a certain kind of conclusion, just because we can recognize reasons for those conclusions doesn't mean those reasons are the causes. Causes for our beliefs can be very different. So what I was trying to get at is at what you were calling the more inductive side is not that um, uh, that I was actively doing induction in any kind of conscious, reflective way, but that automatically, non-inferentially, if you say cat, I think furry. Because there's a causal link that's been developed between the concept cat and furriness in my mind. It's just built up. It's already there. So I don't have to go, hmm, what do I know about cats? Fur. I don't have to do that. It's just automatically there, right? Um, I'm tempted to give a different illustration. We'll see if this works. So how many colors are in a rainbow? How many? I heard three, seven, six fingers I see being held up. Okay, now there's a wise guy in the room. How many colors are in a rainbow? An infinite number. Okay, but what do we see? We see, most people see six or seven bands of color. Somewhere in that neighborhood. Occasionally five if it's a little sort of thin on an edge or something like that. Our perceptual system tells us there are bands of color in the rainbow. We could argue about it. We could come up with evidence for it, reasons to believe it that, there are, that turn out to be false. Um, but it's our perceptual system imposes certain kinds of order on the color spectrum and sees bands where there are not any. Okay? The causal system of the way that our eyes and visual cortex work cause us to form a belief about the rainbow. We could form that in other ways, through reasons, through testimony. You know, well, somebody told me that there are actually seven bands of color and it's Roy G. Biv or something like that or uh, some acronym. I remember this from school and that's why I believe it. Or somebody else in science class once told me that actually it's a full light spectrum, a visible light. Um, and so there actually aren't six or seven bands of color, but basically an infinite number of colors. I may have that reflective idea that I can appeal to, those reasons for forming beliefs or rejecting beliefs, but they're not the same as the causal pathways. That's the point I was trying to get at. And the reason why I want to make that point is it's, I think we, because the, the language around causes and beliefs are so similar, 
that we get tripped up sometimes. The most common examples of these are actually when we dismiss each other's positions on the basis of social causes or psychological causes. Oh, you just say that because you're a man. Okay, there's a reason philosophers say that's an ad hominem and not a valid kind of way of reasoning. But what that's saying is there's something causally important about being a man and its impact on the kinds of things you might say. But that doesn't undercut the reasons that I might have for the particular belief that I have articulated being true. And that, I, I'm beating this drum pretty hard because I'm worried that at this moment in our society, People are forgetting this distinction. And so we're starting to see all kinds of weird stuff where uh, you can't say that because you're part of this group. You can say that because you're part of that group without any reference to, yes, but is it true? Or what's the evidence? Instead, we're going to the causes. Okay, you, But usually they're of the social or individual kind of causal level, not neuroscience. So that's where I'm, I, I don't know if that helps. But, okay. It's now 10.30, so let's uh, go on our break. Oh, oh she, got, she, do we have one back here? The, she, she's okay. been fighting for the mic, pushing people into the aisle. I mean, it just wouldn't be fair. Uh, Real quick, I, a couple of years ago, I, I was watching a NOVA um, on public television about universal consciousness. And there was um, research where they were watching consciousness across the globe and stuff. And they actually saw an uptick in consciousness before 9-11. That there was something that changed on their whatever they were using and stuff. And I guess my question is, is there research looking at the collective that goes beyond culture, that goes beyond groups, is there a, a consciousness? We see it in animals, like before a, a hurricane or something like that, you'll see animals flee before there's even any indication that there's going to be one. And just wondering if there's any kind of research on that. Uh, by consciousness, you mean some kind of an awareness or? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, you know, I probably don't have anything very well informed or intelligent to say about that, I'm afraid. So I shouldn't try, because I'm bound to say something stupid. Um, and, uh, and I'm detecting some sort of collective consciousness that people need to get up and move. So if, if, forgive me. I think we'll just go to break.